So I'm going to kick. So I'm going to kick off, um, and welcome everybody to um, VNOVA webinar. And um, I'm Giles Daly. I'm the head of policy and partnerships at VNOVA, a micromobility management company based in France but working all across Europe. And as part of our industry engagement and thought leadership work, we're running a series of webinars uh, over the coming weeks on very topical mobility issues, looking at the challenges that we're all facing. Um, we've been witnessing changes in global mobility brought out by new business models, innovation, micromobility, and this is supporting as well as challenging classic transport modes. On top of all that, we are now facing unprecedented challenges and turmoil in cities around the world brought about by the COVID crisis. Very briefly, I'll just list a few of the challenges we're facing um, that are captured in um, headlines we're seeing all around the world. Um, from uh, the coronavirus um, affecting shared scooters. Um, do we feel we really need them? Are they still really safe to use? Uh, operators in Europe and other parts of the world pausing operations as overall markets decline for public transport. And this is impacting the users. Uh, and staff members and, and some of the micromobility operators in particular actually starting to shrink their operations. And can the business models be changed actually in the crisis to address some of the topical issues we face around access for key workers or health workers? It's also impacting more broadly public transport as councils, local authorities ask what is the future post-COVID with social distancing? Um, is it killing off much of our, or changing much of our expectations around what public transport was meant to deliver in growing global cities um, that were about, I still remain, the engines of economic growth in cities all over the world? And again, how do we avoid the spread of COVID-19 more generally across the public transport networks? So I'm going to pass it over to on the agenda for this afternoon. We'll be um, we'll have two guest presentations, so about ten minutes each, followed by a short Q and A. Um, and after the two presentations, there'll be time for audience questions, which I think is a very important part of any webinar. The guests will wrap up, and uh, we should finish by uh, quarter to uh, four. UK time, quoted to five in your Central European. Our first guest is Andre Wienhaus. Uh, he is working to develop new mobility services as part of the combined mobility group at SDB, which is Federal Railways in Basel. He calls himself an entrepreneur, uh, bringing new thinking to the organization, and he has previously worked in energy trading, international development, and management consulting. So I'll work the slides and move on to Andre, you're, you're still on here. Right, just realized that after I gave you the message. Yes. So welcome everyone and thank you very much uh, for having me. I've been asked to, to give you um, a little bit of an approach uh, of, of SPB, the, the Swiss national train carrier, for which I work on uh, micromobility and um, I'm absolutely happy to do that. Um, I can only really speak for the uh, COVID impact um, as much as what we can see in the market as we do not have our own micromobility operations, but we work with all of our partners. Um, so, um, if I'm right, Jill, we will hear more about it later, right? From yeah, um, absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. Correct. Okay. So, um, what SPB is doing? If you want to flip over, do I do that? 
if uh, what SDP is doing well, uh, what we do is um, we really understand the micromobility as uh, part of public transport, and we say that uh, we wanna we wanna integrate it in our world on on, on two levels. On on one hand, we wanna really facilitate policies, uh, regulations, and also work towards sustainability in that field. And on the other hand, we want to put our forces into exploration. Uh, which is already on the next slide. Right, uh, we wanna really focus on exploration and um, we do that by, um, by making pilots with uh, different, um, different operators uh, by trying to integrate them and also studying you know, the behavior of, uh, of users of those uh, micro-mobility offerings and uh, of our customers' interaction with, with those offerings. What you see here is that uh, already kind of a, an impression of the pilots that we have done. One hand, we work with the uh, uh, Swiss car share mobility um, and bring them as close as possible to, to the train station. Um, but we also work with a public bike or, or uh, what we have here with micro mobility and uh, bike sharing um, such as uh, um, um, bond mobility. Um, which is, uh, used to be SMITE and CERC, which is no longer active, but uh, which will be replaced by the other operators that are in the field. We uh, have a general, um, or a set of three pillars in which we try to explore this micro field as a train operator. Um, on one hand, we really wanna develop our own um, train stations towards sharing hubs by optimizing kind of the use of space, by designing those sharing zones, and also by working towards a modularization uh, for SPB. And, and this kind of uh, work that we're doing is very similar to what cities uh, might do. And uh, we're also working very closely together and try to work very closely together with cities um, because we're always part of, um, of the city. And we are very, with our hubs are very important um, and not uh, for mobility. And then we have um, our cooperation with providers. Here, it's, it's probably most important to understand that as a train operator, we don't choose a partner and then say, okay, that's our one partner and we work with them throughout uh, the, the country. But um, we try to be really open to everyone and integrate everyone um, that has a good quality offer into our into our um, mobility hubs. Um, we also want to see not only different providers, but also different vehicles. And uh, we are very interested in developing, especially further down the line, developing services, which could probably help them to um, have a more lean cost structure and to be able to offer their services also, not only in cities, but also in uh, places uh, a little bit outside in the peri-urban areas or even in uh, suburban areas. Then uh, the third very important pillar is the, is the know-how part and the competence center, as we call it. So we really try to build up on competences that we can then um, um, put at disposition within our company, but also for other, other interested people um, other, or uh, cities um, and, and our partners, of course. All right, so I think we can go one more. Um, one or two words on the pilot with CERC. Uh, what we did is um, we uh, do have to join with the vision with them to have that first, um, the first uh, uh, mobility sharing zone within our train stations. And, and for us, it was important that, uh, that we would agree, and that's true for every other provider as well that we now work with, that uh, we would agree on a certain level of availability because that is important for our customers and also is a sign of quality that we uh, are able to ensure that they have a secure operations and uh, respect the guidelines that we have for every train stations and for our passenger security and that we um, that we obtain data for them that will then allow us to um, improve on their service and uh, to really get the most out of it. Okay, uh, what we learned on that on, on that pilot mostly is also that um, when we 
integrate micromobility. And that's definitely true for cities as well. We really cannot put those zones anywhere in the train station. It doesn't, it, if they're too far away from the passenger flow, they really have no use. So they need to be in the right place, uh, first of all. And secondly, they really work best uh, when they're incentivized. Um, that's the way they create true customer value. And, um, and therefore, uh, uh, we yeah, kind of enjoy the cooperation with, with the providers goes in that direction. Okay, uh, this slide shows a little bit something that we use internally a lot and uh, is therefore quite interesting. Um, it shows the effect of uh, creating a sharing zone. And uh, this, what you see is the train station of Zurich. And what we studied here is simply the effect of that one single hub that we did in a not so nice place in the Zurich train station. And um, it really surpassed our, our expectations in terms of that by creating the hub, we were able to um, already collect 20% of the traffic that was from those scooters that was going towards the train station. So we were able to collect them in one spot rather than having more distributed. And more importantly, 50% um, of the rides that went from the stray station uh, to anywhere else were from the sharing zone, from that single sharing zone. So it shows really the effect and the value um, that uh, that's having a dedicated place that's in a good spot or even a moderate spot uh, in a tradition, what kind of value it creates for the customer when they uh, switch to, to from the trains to, um, to a scooter or shared mobility on the last mile. Okay. Um, based on that uh, pilot, uh, we kind of adapted uh, a little bit our policies and um, our regulations. I think most importantly that is that we um, uh, really enforce the geofencing of barriers and and uh, there we work very closely together with all the uh, providers. And we also emphasize um, the digital integration uh, as most uh, national train carriers, uh, SUB is also working on a mobility platform. And uh, this mobility platform, of course, uh, has the most value when, when all of the providers and the offerings within a city are present. So um, we try to create this environment where the, the, the physical world also matches the digital world that SBB is offering by integrating the ones that are on our digital platform also in uh, the train station. Okay. Um, one thing that we have uh, also very much picked up is that um, we want to focus also more on the sustainability of those solutions, um, especially when we think about the fact that, um, that venture capital now is uh, a little bit put into question or starts disappearing in, in certain areas of micromobility investments and that public money might uh, replace that venture, cup, uh, venture uh, funds. Because what happens there is then the, the fact of sustainability becomes more and more important and the question of whether those offerings are in fact sustainable. And there we really um, push uh, in three directions. We say that um, uh, while, or in two directions mainly, while we, while we see that the reduction of space that micropilty is used towards private vehicles is already great. Um, it needs to be true that one person kilometer with a micromobility solution um, actually emits less emissions than a person kilometer by the car. And this is something that we really have to work towards and, and make sure it, it is true. And the second thing is that safety regulations are, are improved. And that, for example, things like um, um, uh, kind of low hanging fruits in safety improvement like helmets um, are, are integrated into the offerings of the provider. Uh, in terms of uh, the corona virus, I can only really repeat what we have seen uh, more really from a spectator perspective as this has all uh, caught us uh, by surprise. Um, and what we've seen so far from, from our partners, uh, what's happening is that a lot of them are, 
are, um, are now offering free or sponsored uh, use of their micromobility sharing vehicles, uh, especially for health workers, but also for others. And there are cities that uh, make the first 30 minutes, for example, free to use for all of their citizens. Then um, an important and very interesting uh, movement is that you are able to now book uh, or have one vehicle specifically for you on a monthly subscription. So you kind of reserve a shared vehicle for uh, this time. And of what we heard, this was a very successful approach, uh, both in, in car sharing and in bike sharing. Then um, very promising seems also to be the promotion of subscriptions uh, that are taking effect only after the lock lockdown. So uh, what can be seen now is that apparently the, the sale of such uh, uh, subscriptions are already picking up again, which is definitely a good sign. Then um, uh, something that we have all seen is that uh, real-time traffic data is used to, to reveal changes of, the, of uh, social behavior within the cities. Uh, very interesting for the governments. And um, which I find personally really, really cool is that uh, some cities are already adapting and taking some of their now unused uh, roads and create pop-up bike lanes uh, during the lockdown phase and maybe um, are able to, to influence um, also the use of the streets uh, after, after the virus is probably eased out. Um, very important for us also is uh, that we are now a member of the police network and we find this really, really useful and resourceful. Uh, there are a lot of information and support uh, being provided uh, for the cities and, and from the cities that we also participate in. Excellent. So, yes, I think that's it. I hope I have, have a little bit added to what's yet to come. Yes, thank you very much, Andre. And just very briefly, I mean, we're seeing so much more cycling um, between the city I live in and London, as the roads are much more clear. Um, people have out of their hands and still want to exercise. Is this, do you think, going to change how a company like SBB perhaps looks at micromobility as a supplement to the core services that you already offer? Is this a, a transformation to much more micromobility, do you think, coming out of where we are? I think it's, a, it's not necessarily a transformation. I think it's, it's a confirmation, of at least for us, of what we have already seen before, what are the take we have already taken before. Um, it is for us as a as a train national train carrier. Um, we really connect cities. So for us, uh, uh, seeing this uh, just tells us that it's important that we work with bike sharing um, and with ways that uh, with different ways of transportation. And it definitely shows that uh, different situations needs different ways uh, of uh, mobility. Excellent. And, uh, a diverse mobility is definitely an advantage to have in every city. Excellent. I'm going to go on to Sylvain now, and we'll come back to you a little bit later. Welcome, Sylvain. <laughs> um, and I'll briefly introduce you, and then I'll give you a few minutes to um, go through the story you wanted to tell as well. And then we'll open it up to Q&A across our audience online. So again, Sylvain Ho is a direct, Senior Director of Strategy at UITP, the International Association of Public Transport, based in Brussels. He started his career at the Trade Office of the French Embassy in Rome, looking at transport land use and policy. He was also um, in the head office of SNCF in Brussels, and he's a former Secretary General of Polis, where he was working before he joined UITP. So then, over to you, and I'll work your slides. Thank you very much, guys. Um, uh, I'm glad to be with you. Uh, I thank Henry uh, for this interesting uh, views on, from SBB. I will focus more on the impact on uh, public transport and broaden up a little bit uh, uh, at the end of my slides. I will focus also on the current impact. And again, at the end, open up to the long-term short well, short term mid term and long term impact but I, i'm starting by looking at what is the situation today can you next slide um just keep going um 
UITP, I will be very, very short. Uh, I see on the list of attendees that most of us know us. Uh, we are the worldwide network bringing together all public transport stakeholders on, and all stable transport modes. We have, um, so we are multi-stakeholder bringing together public transport operators, authorities, um, different types of mobility actors and the industry, the supply industry. Uh, we are global. We are in uh, about 100 countries and we have 1,800 members companies from across the world. Um, next slide. Now, if we look at the impact of the crisis on public transport, uh, I took this uh, graph from Move It, because their colors were nicer than the other ones, but you would find the same from um, local actors, from national actors, from, uh, from Google, Apple, and many others. Basically, in most of the countries under lockdown, we have a drop in ridership down to five, seven percent. So the current level of ridership is around five, seven percent compared to a normal uh, and compared to before. You have a few differences. We know, for instance, in um, in Sweden, for instance, where the lockdown is less stringent, you're still, uh, uh, you're above this level. We are at 25, 30 percent of the current level. Um, uh, in, in Asia, uh, excepting Wuhan and, uh, and a couple of other Chinese cities, the drop in ridership is, uh, is not as strong. You know, we are more around 30% uh, of the normal level. That's interesting to, to note. Um, of course, as a result, this has a very strong impact on the funding of public transport because we basically lost nearly all fare revenues uh, for public transport. Next slide, please. So there is also an impact, of course, on operations and staff. With 5% of ridership, we're still providing in many cities around 75% of the services. And that's required um, to enable services for essential workers um, and to preserve um, safe distancing. Um, we have published a number of uh, recommendations and we are on a daily basis trying to help our members cope with the crisis. The focus on the current operations is very much on protecting the staff, protecting our workers. This is very important. Um, it's very important to preserve their health. It's also very important to preserve the level of service in a place which has started to tackle the crisis probably later, such as New York, this is actually a problem. There is not only a decrease of service, there is also a decrease, uh, a shortage of workers. We also have to protect the travelers who have to use uh, public transport and that through a number of measures to disinfect, protect, uh, the area and to enforce social distancing. And all this goes with the reduction of services and also with discouraging people actually who don't have to travel to, to travel. Next slide. And we have, uh, we, we've, we've wanted to recognize the, the, the key role played by those who are helping to maintain the services since except uh, in Wuhan, no full network has closed their public transport service. So in all cities, public transport has, uh, has been maintained to a level which has enabled um, uh, traveling for essential workers. And we, we have, we've launched campaigns, Guardians of Mobility, to recognize the, the role of those uh, workers of the public transport sector. Next slide. In addition to what I've said, we've seen a number, this is not the greatest picture, but it's uh, from the Nantes uh, agglomeration. We've seen a number of on-demand transport solutions either being redirected to support um, the travel of the health professionals or uh, being created for this purpose. So uh, in addition to the adjustment of the operation of mass public transport, we certainly see as well the deployment of um, specific on-demand transport solution at the moment. Next slide. Now, if you broaden beyond public transport, um, and I'm sorry if I'm saying the obvious or being repetitive, but of course, it's interesting to put that in relation to the impact of the crisis on urban mobility and on mobility in general, uh, and to, 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 to relate the two things. Um, April, uh, I used movie before, no, Apple, release data and you can see that the level of driving has decreased significantly in almost all countries. Italy 78%, UK 65%, uh, US 35%. Uh, 
Uh, this is true at the country level, this is true at the local level. Uh, I showed the curve for Torino and, uh, and the Piemonte region. Uh, you can see Turin a uh, huge decrease uh, uh, by nearly 80% of the level of traffic and uh, even uh, less, uh, sorry, even a greater decrease at the level of the region. So it's the whole urban mobility system which is impacted, of course, but it's interesting to see the numbers and to, to relate them. Next slide. So you can see this decrease for all modes, except guess what, cycling. Um, this, I'm not sure because I missed the few, few, first few slides. I'm not sure if my uh, colleague from SBB showed this, but if you look at Switzerland, which is what I, I found, uh, and you can see the, the source on the, on the slide, you have a huge surge in cycling. And we've seen uh, also temporary deployment of, uh, uh, of some, some in, in one form or another of cycling path uh, to take advantage of this, to, to, to encourage cycling, but also to accommodate uh, uh, this surge in cycling. And of course, this was a question for the future. You just address them. Uh, and we will have to take that into account for the future. Next slide. So that's a big question that everybody is asking. Um, everybody's trying to answer. So we, I think we should stay modest in, uh, in trying to answer this question on the future of urban mobility. Uh, for public transport, what we are looking at is probably the need to have increasingly coordinated schedules. Why? Because we have, we'll have to be much stronger at um, anticipating, just stay on the slide below, please. Thank you. In managing flows to avoid crowds, crowd, to avoid crowdings, crowdings, sorry. Um, so coordination of schedules should help in this direction. What we can see also is the acceleration of the development of some technological solutions. Uh, we've been talking forever of uh, sharing information on the number of travelers on one vehicle, on buses, adapting the, the system to the number of uh, passengers on a given uh, public transport vehicles. And then in the last week, we've seen this type of information starting to be, to be shared. So more than new development and new solutions, I think uh, what I see is acceleration. I think it's a key word for, for the understanding of the whole crisis. It's not necessarily a new thing, but it's the acceleration of trends we, 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 we were seeing developing. We will probably see an evolution of the governance. The impact of public, on public transport actors varies greatly depending on the type of contracts they have for running their operation, how much they depend on commercial revenues, for, for instance, um, and also uh, the, the role of the public transport authority and its ability to raise fin funding for public transport may require an evolution of the governance framework. We'll certainly see an adjustment of services to the demand, reinforcing the com complementarity between all modes. Uh, and that's very important. Uh, and that's kind of uh, echoing the, the, the question you had for SDB before, guys, which is um, the coordination of schedules goes together with making the complementarity between all collective and shared mode of transport a reality <laughs> to better manage the flows and to offer more uh, efficient alternative to the private car trips, since we are afraid that the use of a private car will be the first, the, 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 the mode of travel uh, of choice immediately after the crisis uh, for reason of fear related to shared and collective mode of transport and the spread of the virus. We'll also have to adapt to the new requirements related to the crisis, the sanitary measures, and some of the things will last very long and for every also forever, because it will also raise the standards uh, of the services we offer to uh, passengers. Now, I will finish with uh, two slides, which so show some hope. We are expecting, as I said, the driving to be the travel of choice. However, it's interesting to see, if you look at Shenzhen, um, and do the graph of the first week after returning to work and the volume of passengers in Shenzhen Metro, you can see that week after week, it increases. It's not back to the level of before the crisis, but you can see an increase. So you can see people coming back to shared and collective modes of transport. Since building trust, getting back our customers to the level 
the record level, I would say, we had before the crisis would be a main challenge. This is interesting. And in the last, the last slide, and just more food for thought, I'd like to show the evolution in the next slide, the Very evolution of, uh, uh, of public transport ridership in Brussels. Um, I, I hadn't time to find the 2015-17 detail, which is what I wanted to show. But I would like to remind that in Brussels, we had a terrorist attack in March 2016. And that created fear um, in our customer base for, to use public transport. It took some time. It took about a year. If you would be able to look in detail at this graph, you would see it took about a year. But after 12 months, the level of ridership was again what it was uh, before the bombing. And now it's much above. So it takes time, but bringing back citizens to collective and mode of transport, providing our sector, public transport, and all other actors of the offering shared mobility, shared and collective mode of transport, uh, provide uh, the high level of service, um, would enable to, uh, to, to offer the a credible alternative to the private car on the, on the long run. And that's Thank it. you very much, Sylvain. And um, I've had a number of questions coming in, and audience, please send in your questions. But Sylvain, um, what do we say to the people, the authorities, who, the city leaders who say, we should be going back to driving? Uh, it's safer, it's self-isolated. Well, clearly I have a challenge with that as well. But how do we challenge that message at this point in time and going forward? You know, I mean, it's, um, there is a big challenge, which is um, every day is different than the day before. So uh, I, uh, uh, and what I mean by that is that the, the information we receive from the health authorities, from the governments is not, let's say, stable. Um, but we, we have several things to say. First, the sector, the overall sector is doing its best um, to ensure and provide um, a safe environment for the travelers. The second strong message on the long run, and we'll have to, to develop it further, which is why I'm, uh, I'm being very cautious, is that the crisis we're experiencing today we could be experiencing it for other matters in some cities in the future. Um, we know natural disasters, uh, the number of natural disasters is increasing because of climate change. So if we want to avoid crisis in the future, we need to provide solutions, especially to the challenge of climate change. And driving the private car cannot be the solution. And actually, my recommendation, my strong message will be we need to, uh, to get back to the situation with a proper uh, framework for driving, for instance, reinstalling parking rules, which are not there anymore in cities. Um, and we should even use this uh, crisis uh, to accelerate the implementation, for instance, of road users. Uh, we'll have problems of funding for sustainable modes of transport, We'll have challenges maybe for adapting the infrastructure. Let's, uh, let's, uh, let's use road, um, road uh, charging for this, uh, for this purpose. Uh, it's, a it's a dialogue we're going to have over the next month, uh, an ongoing one, uh, which will depend also on the rule decided by the authorities. Absolutely. There are a range of challenges we're going to face there in engaging our stakeholders and political leaders around transport issues. I have a question from Clement uh, Yimo for probably Andre and Sylvain. Do you think that PTAs will reduce the financing for innovative mobility schemes, micromobility carpooling, um, because of the reduced commercial revenue and almost uh, difficulty of operation in this kind of um, new mobility world? So perhaps Andre and Sylvain, do you want to give any comments on that? Um, I can't, I think it's too early to say that, um, I can't really see right now if that will happen or not. Um, 
because it really all depends how quickly we we're gonna get out of this and how much you know damage it will do um, in like the mid run. But uh, it definitely wouldn't be a desirable outcome. So I think we will definitely try and not reduce any of the findings that's already there, especially if we think about the fact that um, that financing or public financing will get increasingly important. Okay, thank you. And Sylvain, did you want to add any more to that? I agree with what Andrew says. I'm pretty sure, and I'm sorry for giving you a pretty obvious answer, it will depend. It will vary between cities. Yeah. And it will vary also between the type of schemes, mode, and solutions. I think micro mobility is too broad a category. Um, I think it will be the answer will be much refined. I'm pretty sure some services will gain uh, and will receive more support, but for others, it will be more difficult. Do you think this will change, though, the expectations or need for authorities to have a more direct role? in the management, if not tendering, of these new innovation services? So again, a question for us for both of you. Andre, if you maybe want to go first. Sorry, could you repeat that? Do you think this will change the expectation that authorities may have to tender or have a more direct financial role in the managing and delivery of new innovation mobility services? Um, I don't know. Can't really say. Yes, I mean it should, should, uh, should change it. Okay, and Sylvain, anything from your point of view? That's a difficult one. I think there will be a, a greater. Uh, I'll go back to my mass ferry transport. I think there will be a greater incentive to look at this complementarity uh, and to ensure this uh, complementarity. So what Henry showed before uh, in his presentation, I would expect that to get stronger support um, because the, 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 the pressure um, will be stronger to make the system work better. I have a question from Paul Gaspar, um, perhaps more to you, Sylvain. Um, regarding the adaptation of street use, can you tell us any kind of key cities you've seen have been leading out innovative policies to reallocate street space and again create more social isolation, um, social space for isolation and still enable the users to get around their city, probably by cycling? Any kind at of the street at the, at the street level? At street level, yes. I would rather let that to uh... I'm sure there is someone online who has better answer than I do. No, I wouldn't be. Uh, uh, I've seen, I've seen, but uh, I don't have such a, a strong, uh, strong overall view on this. I, I've seen some examples, uh, of course, uh, but uh, no, sorry. No, that's fine. Do you want to do that, Andre? Did you want to add anything to that? Anything from Switzerland in terms of reallocation of street space? Um. I haven't seen it really so much either, or it doesn't come to my mind. It might exist, um, but there are a lot of a lot of things that's being talked about. I would say, and there are some really promising approaches. Mm. Um, comes to mind because we have seen things in the city of Amsterdam that Amsterdam is planning, um, and uh, yeah, uh, I think important there is that that this adaption of street use should happen community-based, which means that that you would involve the community that is directly affected in that reallocation. Um, and there are some good examples um, of how that's done. And that's uh, really uh, in Amsterdam what I, what I know of. Again, unfortunately, 45 minutes goes by very, very quickly. So we're just coming up to the end of our slot for this webinar. But um, any final thoughts for both Sylvain and Andri? And I particularly I'd ask the question of a year from now, what perhaps do you think will have changed and hopefully that will be for the better. But any final thoughts? Perhaps, Andre, do you want to go first? 
Yeah, I think uh, I'm quite positive on everything. I think that integration will continue. Uh, that cities will will continue on their uh, to integrate micromobility as a part of the public transport, and as well um, all of the uh, PTAs. Okay, and so then, your final thoughts? We will put much more emphasis on managing the demand um, of any type of, uh, of transport um, uh, in relation to... It's, um, it's required for efficiency reason, and there was some effort. Now it's going to be required to manage the impact of the crisis uh, and um, this is something which could on the long will be difficult on the on the short and mid term, but which could bring very positive uh, things on the long term. Excellent. So again, our time is coming to an end, and I'd like to thank Andre Wienerts from the Combined Mobility Group at SBD in Switzerland, as well as Sylvain Ho, Director of Strategy at UITP, for joining us today and sharing some of their thoughts on the mobility challenges that we're facing. Very briefly, our next webinar will be on April 28th, and we plan on inviting cities and micromobility operators to talk more specifically about some of the challenges that we're facing now and we'll face through the summer into the autumn and next year around mobility. And again, via Nova, <clears throat> we're an emerging thought leader in the areas of mobility and urban space management. We're keen to work with cities to promote new transport modes, such as micromobility, enforce reasonable and fair rules for deployment and enforcement, and better integrate these modes with the wider transport system. Thank you for joining us. Keep safe. Thank our guests. And hopefully speak to you again soon. I'm Giles Bailey. Goodbye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.